Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> the internet vol uh, fly to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, this is great. Very great. I'm hoping to, to see you again in Santos. It's wonderful to, to, to have a meeting with you. So now welcome. the technology is helping us indeed. <laughs> welcome, very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, people. Uh, we ask you all please to, to mute your microphone right now. And uh -huh. uh, Professor Clayson Mello will uh, start the presentation. And I want to thank to, to say thank you, uh, Professor Tarasti, for your uh, presence in our Villa Lobo Symposium. And uh, I, I give the way to Professor Song Mello to start our uh, lecture of Mr. Uh, Professor Tarasti. Olá, todo mundo. Bom dia. Né? Eu vou agora é, dar início a essa sessão agora essa palestra do Professor Ero Tarasti. Uh, só um segundo. Cadê? Ele caiu, não? Eu acho que ele foi desligar o microfone e, e deve ter encerrado a sessão, né? Talvez Bom, mas, é, mas enquanto ele chega, né, eu posso já ir introduzindo, né? Que a gente adianta. Bom, professor, o professor Ero Tarashi é professor emérito hoje da, da Universidade de Helsinki, né, na Finlândia. É um dos, dos grandes nomes da, da, da semiótica, né, um semioticista assim, de grande influência. É, tem títulos de honoris causa com, em algumas universidades, como a Indiana University, a New Bulgarian University. É, é autor de muitos livros e, e, e de uma teoria da semiótica das mais fascinantes que tem, né, que é a semiótica existencial. E ele publicou alguns livros como Mito e Música, Heitor Villa-Lobos, Teoria da Música, da Semiótica Musical. É, signo e música e mais recentemente ele publicou um livro chamado Zeiss and Shine que faz digamos assim esse fechamento todo dessa teoria né que ele vem desenvolvendo desde 99 e para dar início então a essa, essa palestra eu passo a palavra então para o professor Ero Tarash please Ero you can start now Ero The microphone is mute and the, In the camera. The camera is off. Jogos, você consegue fazer algo aí por nós? Eu já solicitei para ele. Deve ter aparecido um botão lá para ele apertar. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, but I can't see myself, so it's... <laughs> yes. Wait a minute. Now? Yes, right here now. Here we are. <laughs> oh, so... So I'm sitting here in Helsinki uh, in our, in, at, at piano, and uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Paulo de Tarso Salles for organizing this um, very important musicological meeting on Ator Villa Lobos. And, at the same time, I, I thank Paulo for the translation of my, my Bilobo study into Portuguese, which has been the dream of my life a long time, but uh, which I have not been able to fulfill myself. But I'm now very uh, proud uh, and um, happy that uh, I hear that it will be 
published in connection to your celebration of the centenary of the Semana de Arte Moderna in Sao Paulo, 1922. Which, uh, we try also here in Helsinki uh, organize something, but of course, what happens there is, is probably more important. Anyway, thank you very much here. And um, uh, to pre prepare this speech, I have got some uh, questions in advance already from uh, Professor Sidios Nio Neto, Rodolfo Coelho, and Norton Dudek. And uh, I, I try to include the answers uh, to, to, um, to these um, very fascinating, relevant questions uh, within my lecture. Uh, to start, um, uh, I perhaps need a little bit uh, tell about my researcher's position because it might um, sound rather strange that a Finnish musicologist dedicates much of his work to, the, to a Brazilian composer on the other side of the globe. But in fact, the, the, the origin of my uh, stay in Brazil with my wife, Ayla, who is pianist in 1976, a long time ago, as students, was not Villa Lobos, but it was um, because of Claude Levi Strauss, who was my, my great idol and, and teacher in Paris uh, of structuralism. And so I wanted to study the myth and music uh, in the traces of Levi Strauss in Brazil. That, and then I got a grant from Rotary Foundation to do this. But uh, to tell the truth, my uh, professor in musicology, Erik Tavasian, who is famous for his Sibelius studies, told me that um, you should write perhaps a book about Edward Villalobos. <laughs> there are not much research on that. And so I kept this in my mind. And um, uh, when I entered uh, Rio de Janeiro, which was my place, Universidad um, de Federal Rio de Janeiro, um, my, my Indian <laughs> anthropological journey was never fulfilled. But then I, I started to visit um, Museo Villalobos in Palacio de Cultura in downtown. I worked with Arminda Villalobos, who was then still directing it. And, and then I got into this huge Villalobos universe, which, as you all know, is enormous. And then, uh, during the time, I gathered scores and sources from Brazil and also from North American libraries and here in the European libraries, so that uh, it may be that I'm the, uh, the person in the world who, who owns almost everything on Villalobos, whether if it is possible, namely. Uh, and after all, this was fascinating. I was prepared for Villalobos already before my travel to Brazil in Paris, uh, where I was a student in, uh, of Gremas uh, in Paris school and, uh, and uh, Levi Strauss, of course, uh, and um, um, met uh, Brazilian uh, a music scholar Luis Heitor Correa de Azevedo, who, who became uh, very important for me, and as you know, who was very important in Brazilian um, uh, musicology. Uh, then we heard first uh, um, impressions of Brazilian music also by Ana Stella Chic, pianist who was teacher of my wife Ayla, who played in, in um, um, diplomat concert at the uh, Avenue President, President Wilson, uh, Vila Lobos, Danza de Indio Branco, and, and, um, and some other pieces of Villalobos. And then Louis Hayter told me that I should first start with Uira Puru, maybe Erosan, and, and, and I, I could go to Max Essig to buy these scores. Anyway, then I was in Brazil and, in, and back in Finland, and it uh, took still years to, to write the book first in Finnish. It appeared, uh, wait a minute, was it 86 or maybe 84, I've forgotten. Uh, but then the American version um, uh, appeared at uh, North Carolina, McFarland, and it has been sold out a long time. Anyway, let's go now to the topics. Um, uh, my theme today is to compare two, so to say, national composers, namely Villa Lobos and Jean Sibelius, who is our great national composer. Because there are very interesting parallels in, in, uh, in both cases, which somehow unite and also, uh, also uh, disunite these, these two uh, truly great composers who became a kind of both a kind of national icons of their culture. But their attitudes towards this um, position was somewhat different. I think Villa Lobos accepted 
uh, it rather willingly uh, in 1930 when Getulio Vargas entered power that he will become the superintendent of musical education and started Bachianas and something very, very romantic and very national, so to say. Whereas Sibelius was put to this role, not so much because he, he would have wanted it, because what Sibelius wanted to be was absolutely a symphonist. He wanted to belong to the, to the uh, Central European canon of musical work, a great symphonist in the side of, of Richard Strauss, Mahler, uh, Brahms, uh, in, in this line. And, and um, well, here we enter now the, the post-colonial issue a little bit, because um, you know that um, very often books about Sibelius open with phrases like, um, um, his music reflects the beautiful nature, mythology, and habits uh, of, of this um, Nordic people in, as a true picture. Well, that sounds quite nice, but it, it is, um, I'm, as you say, it is colonialist discourse, where, because then he is put to the category of something exotic, eccentric, uh, extraordinary, something out of the center of the, of the um, musical lang, lang to use the Saussure's term about, about music. So I mean that, um, but Sibelius could not avoid this because, you know, um, uh, he studied the first uh, uh, in Helsinki uh, with Martin Vegelius, who was great Wagnerian. And, but then he was sent rather quickly to Berlin to study with Professor Becker, a very strict counterpoint teacher, uh, 1887, 1888. And um, there he composed his first major work which he later withdrew from performance, namely Piano Quintetto in five movements, which is uh, fantastic. It is Sibelius before Sibelius. It's not the Sibelius of Finlandia. No, it's something before. So that's why it is so exciting. Now, if we compare Sibelius with Richard Strauss, who was of the same age, you could say that um, Richard Strauss at that time was already making a big career as composer and conductor in Central Europe. Where Sibelius was just, um, uh, as he said himself, erscheinung aus den Wäldern, so appearance from the forests. So he was just uh, only learning uh, how, to, uh, how to compose. Rias Strauss said about Sibelius that um, ich kann mehr, aber er ist größer. I can more, but he is greater. So he admitted. Anyway. Um, Sibelius then left Berlin because he spent extremely bohemian life. He was very bohemian like Villa Lobos. So um, he had extremely, <laughs> he was hospitalized many times for the because of his drinking and, and other with his Scandinavian <laughs> colleagues. And then Ferruccio Buzzoni, who was his friend, because Buzzoni had been in, in Helsinki, 87, as piano teacher, and they got befriended. Then Buzzoni sent him to Vienna to study with Brahms or Bruckner, but they were too old. And so he entered with, um, ended up with Karl Goldmark and wrote his first great work, Kullervo Symphony, based on Kalevala, tragical story on Kullervo. And this was performed in Helsinki University um, Solemnity Hall, 1893. And then it became quite obvious that Finnish music had, had been born. There was something which was talking to the whole nation, which was something which was um, essential for the Finnish identity altogether. And then Sibelius became the icon. But Villalobos, if you think of his life, which is quite extraordinary, um, he had also, um, he, want, he was first, as you know, the Shoros musician, like Sibelius wanted to be a great violinist. That was his intention first, to be a great, great violinist, but he was too nervous. He couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't um, perform publicly. He tried to enter the Vienna Philharmonic here, but they told him, you can't come here, you are too nervous. Now, so then he started composing. Now, Villa Lobos, he was cellist, and after all, he did not remain one of those folk musicians, which is very interesting. Although, he, uh, as we know from testimonies, he was very deep in these um, Soros circles in Rio de Janeiro. But he had the idea that I, I want to become a sort of classical composer. And then, as you know, um, um, all this happened. Um, 
um, his conservatory studies, and then in Sao Paulo, in this um, Semana Arte Moderna, he was performed, but that was not yet the, 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 the real philologos. Now, anyway, I will say that um, um, uh, these two composers um, are um, interesting because um, they have a quite special position in the European well, European history. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. I may be too Eurocentric. You are Brazilians. You may not like that if I say Philippos as a Euro European, but but um, that's a big problem because um, it's the same problem with Rus Russians. Russians think that uh, they have something unique, uh, non-European um, <laughs> entity, soul, uh, Eastern, something which is distinguishing them from the European music. Uh, even now, when you go to Moscow, Tchaikovsky Conservatory, I remember I was uh, introduced to a teacher of uh, music history. That meant only Russian music. Then came professor of Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Bach. That was European. It was the uh, peripheric. Center was the Russian. So they had this illusion, but of course it is an illusion. The philosopher Vladimir Salovyev already said that there is no such a special Russian identity. It's all from Europe, what is valuable in Russia. Now, about Brazil and Latin America, you know, this is the colonial relation, Europe, Latin America. Um, we speak about the colonial, colonialized imagination, which means that the people born in South America appreciate only the art of the great European centers and not themselves enough. And the, the movement between these continents has always been like, like that the, the best known uh, novelties of the Europe have been immediately performed in South America, but not other ways around. Normally, uh, South Americans have come to Paris, which is the capital of South America, as you know, <laughs> to study. Um, this is the case of Villalobos, of, of, of so many, Uribe Holguin from Colombia, etc., in many, many cases. But, um, well, as you know, Vinola was, um, <laughs> was quite obstinate nature, and he um, did not accept his role as any, any student of anything, but he wanted to show. He was very convinced of his himself, like was Sibelius. They were both, had both very self, very great uh, self-confidence, um, uh, um, so to say, that they, they are something important. Now, anyway, um, this relation is interesting. I have my post-colonial theory. It's part of my semiotic issues. Let me tell now that this book on Villalobos is quite traditional classical historical musicology, in which I have not used semiotic theories at all. Of course, it's written by a semiotician, so it's unavoidable, but maybe um, some thoughts come from this source. But, but anyway, it is readable uh, without any education in semiotics. But the um, post-colonial uh, issue um, is a very serious one, and I have a, a um, semiotic model or solution in which I consider it essentially as a um, relation between the two subject positions, namely the dominant and dominated. The dominant is a colonizer, dominated is the colonized. And normally the uh, dominant has taken the lang in his power, so the language of the music, the grammar. Grammar is dictated by dominance, the colonizers. And those who are colonized, they only have to accept it and, 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 and try to adopt it. And those who do something else, they can be totally disqualified. But that happened, uh, I think, to some extent, to Villalobos in, in the European centers and also to, to Sibelius to some extent and also to Villalobos in his own country because you know that uh, when he was performed in uh, in um, Rio or Sao Paulo then um, you remember that the critic Oscar Guanabarino who said that we can't bring the carnival music to concert hall he was totally against and then even worse Mario de Andrade who I think is the probably the greatest intellectual he had in Brazilian uh, cultural history in his Ensaio sobre a Musica Brasileira and in many others. He was totally critical about Villalobos. And um, so Mario de Andrade never accepted Villalobos as representative of the Brazilian identity. Of course, 
de Andrade questioned this identity altogether. He said that there is no Brazilian identity. <laughs> he said that uh, Frenchmen, Mexicans, all they have identity. We don't have in Brazil, he said. And, and so um, uh, that was sad because I've always thought that, let's say, if you think of a literary work like Makunaima, its musical counterpart is absolutely rude poem by Vila Lobos. So Vila Lobos absolutely fulfilled uh, Marinara's uh, deepest dreams in his music, but, but um, uh, that was not recognized by, by this um, great um, uh, music scholar and intellectual. Uh, so Vila Lobos was criticized there, and then later, of course, in, the, uh, in Paris, he was accepted as something exotic because uh, Paris is always willing to have some exotic elements, uh, always. Uh, it, it, it took the Russian ballets by Diaghilev and Stravinsky and, and, and Prokofiev and ev everything there uh, and loved them. And so also Vilna was, was accepted in the 1920s when he came there and, and he moved in those circles of the avant-gardists. And, and his music of that time was very avant-garde in the European sense. Uh, like, take Soros number eight, it's very close to Edgar Varese. Uh, they were born in the same concert, for, for instance. But um, later, I would say that um, his Bachian style as a neoclassical uh, series in the 1930s was a little bit uh, belated for neoclassicism in the Europe. Uh, and then, of course, his late output was most often taken as some kind of <laughs> not just a light, light entertainment music, but uh, but something where not, not quite serious. And, and many scholars did not appreciate him very much. And then he passed away in 1959. I think uh, um, magazines stopped writing about him and he was a little bit aside. About uh, Sibelius, um, who became national icon in Finland, really. Great. So that all the other composers have been in the shadow of Sibelius. Inner Englund, great symphonist, even published his memories, uh, is still going out Sibelius in Swedish, in the shadow of Sibelius. He was, he was so strong, so great, uh, that, that um, no one could, could um, avoid it. But Sibelius was accepted his symphony writing in England. In England, he was extremely popular, and in the United States, until the Second World War. Uh, then uh, he got his first critic, named Theodor Adorno, who published in London, 1937, his uh, murderish critic of Sibelius, uh, Glossa Ide Sibelius. Um, but Adorno's critics uh, was political by its reason, because um, he was a refugee from Germany in London, and he saw how, how Sibelius was much performed in London and also in Germany in, at that, that time, used uh, for the propaganda. So um, he um, totally, um, rejected uh, Sibelius. I have here Adorno's essay here, this famous. Um, wait a minute. Oh, can you? <laughs> Zeitschrift für Sozial Forschung by Max, Max Horkheimer, in which he, he really totally dooms Sibelius that he, he is that the, all the all the trickling, all the accords, all the uh, triers sound cling and shown by the Rhein and Falsch. Is Ein Stravinsky wider willen, nur hat er weniger talent. And then uh, in Sibelius we hear it's all nature, all nature. Uh, but but this, this was very bad in Adorno's, Adorno's ideology because it goes too much on the ideology in Germany at that time. So, but Adorno's Im impact was very strong and continues still in the Central Europe in the reception of Jean Sibelius. In France, you know, René Lebovitz, the great uh, uh, Dodecavonist, wrote an essay, um, uh, Qui est le plus mauvais compositeur du monde? Well, it was 1950s, it was such a pun in <laughs> circulating in France that who is the worst composer of the world? And then René Lebovitz invented, ah, it is Jean Sibelius. Another wrote that Sibelius is Delius plus Sinding <laughs> becomes Sibelius. So, so, so little they appreciated. Uh, so Adorno's impact was strong and is still living in the certain circles, but uh, in the minimalist time, they accept Sibelian um, 
um, profound logic of musical form, this gradual processes of changes as something minimalist like Steve Reich or Philip Glass. And so he, he became important for the minimalist composers. And so he was uh, uh, rehabilitated by, the, by these avant-garde composers. Now I want to go to, yes, to, to semi this little bit, because I promised to answer also to these three questions by, by my, my uh, I see Professor Dios Nio Meto is there. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, and also maybe um, two other people are, are somewhere there. Um, uh, the, the questions by, wait a minute. Um, oops, oops. They are first about the, my narratological study, whether, whether narratology could be applied to see values. I mean, the narratology in the sense of my uh, study, a theory of musical semiotics, which, as you know, is very gray Massian uh, following the, the um, um, Paris School of Semiotics, and uh, which was, by the way, that book was very much used in the United States in many universities. And Barbara Alman wrote his A Theory of with Narrative Music. It was just uh, uh, after my book. So, and um, that method, which is very rigorous, and whose perhaps um, um, highest um, result is my study on Chopin, G minor ballet, which is very formalized um, uh, and which was accepted even by my Polish scholars, the real Chopin specialists. Well, um, uh, that method is still valid. I, I don't give up my, my, my past. Uh, I, I always uh, preserve, preserve a certain fidelity to Grima school. I, I still use isotopies, modalities, themes, etc. Debrayage, embrayage, these ideas, actoriality, spatiality, temporality, these uh, discursive issues. I, I, you, can, uh, you can freely use them, even if you become an existential semitician, <laughs> I, I would say. Uh, and then my second phase in semiotics uh, is this existential semiotics. And um, that is something I've continued during uh, over 20 years, already by publishing a lot of books in, in English, uh, in Berlin by Buton de Greiter. There are these um, uh, semiotics of classical music, which I had in 2015, and then Sein und Schein explorations in existential semiotics, a little bit later, which is uh, my theory. Um, and then, of course, the first one was this existential semiotics by Indiana University Press in 2000. It was my, my first study. And then I had a lot in French, in Italian, in Chinese. I have three books in Bulgarian, Albanian, in languages. So, but I mean, um, now let's go back to Villalobos. I try to apply one issue, which is perhaps the most important. Uh, now, uh, a theoretical model, which I call Zemic model. Now, uh, Son, could you pass uh, some diagrams? Yes, yes. If possible. <laughs> Great. You see here that there are a model with four corners, and it is something like the so called semiotic square by Gramas, as you see. But the entities I, I put there, you see first in English, um, are stemming from Hegel's logic, which is the logic. So Hegel is important. And now you notice my whole existential semiotics is nothing but a combination of the continental philosophy. I mean, the German Kant, Hegel, uh, Schelling, uh, Kierkegaard, Danish, uh, and then Heidegger, Jaspers. And then, of course, Sartre, Jean Val, Marcel, and the classical semiotic theory by, by Gray Marcel, uh, Umberto Eco, Lotman, Peirce, many others. So it's a combination of these two brands. And then by that, I try to create some new uh, epistemological situation for the whole theory of an analysis of semiotics. So you see here uh, four corners. Um, what I've done here is that I put some. Um, you see the German by an mir sein, für mich sein, <coughs> für sich sein, an, an sich sein. That is from Hegel. But this mir or mich, 
is me, it is, um, or something else, it is category of me, I, ego, which I put there. And now can you show some of the next model? Yes. So, you see, um, this is what I call the semic model. Why is it semic? There is set because it's no longer a um, categorical square, very Cartesian, uh, with these uh, four separate discrete identities, but there is a movement like set in two directions. And then it is enic. Enic comes from the linguist, American linguist Kenneth Pike, and it, it means they just uh, see the things from, from, from in, internal side, for in, for, for in, from inner side. So that's why it's semic. And now you see that um, I replaced the corners so that uh, we have moi and soi. Uh, in the right upper corner, uh, right um, left upper corner, we have the body. Body is moi one. Body. It's, uh, I'm sorry, there is a mistake. It's, uh, <laughs> it is chaotic, kinetic. It's uh, energy without any, any articulation. That's moi one. When this Moavan, this body gets articulated, well, when you grow up, when you get educated, you get got a pers person identity. We had it, like Peirce said it. You get more stabilized. That is Moa too. But then there is the, the other source, is the Sua, which is the society. And so you see on the um, right lower corner is Sua 1 which is society and its norms and values, aesthetics as <clears throat> abstract categories. <clears throat> and then you see S2, uh, which are these categories put in the social practice. So genre, form, topics, or all such things which are of social nature are in SWA2. And so these two words of moa and SWA, me and society, like I don't know what put it, they are united with this movement so that there is one movement from, from body, sensuality, from kinetics towards the SWA1, the abstract values, one movement, and the other movement from the uh, SWA1 towards the MUA. Um, it's like Levi Strauss, if you like. Levi Strauss spoke about le sensible. MUA1, that's le sensible. SWA1, l'intelligible. The intelligible, the the, <laughs> the 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 abstract thing, and so um, either the body is gradually sublimated, more one, more two, so two, so one uh, into uh, so one, or so one is uh, embodied, embodied, incorporated into something. Let's take some example. Let's say if you are, wait a minute. Um, if you have a very, very good body, one, uh, you, you train it, and then um, you may become a ballet dancer as a profession in SWA2. A ballet dancer fulfills the value of the, of the, of the, um, of, of the, of the, of the, of the value of the movement. Or if you are a musician, you, uh, you may have first the musical aesthetics, SWA1, then you have conservatory, SWA2. M2, you have a musician, a musician must have a certain type of body or to be that. So if you are in the very much patriotic, you may, might have the patriotism, SWA1, then you might have army, SWA2, then you might have the soldier, MOA2, and then his body which must be something what you need. And so um, uh, I think this is the model of the human mind. And so human mind can be fixed and determined only by referring always to these four moments which live there side by side simultaneously and, and even in, 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 in conflict sometimes with each other. Now, uh, Son, can you put the third model in which I, I put the, these ideas to the Jody um, Lotman's model of the generative nature, if you put it, yeah. Here you see the You may see the model of the construction of the texts, 
symbol, semantics, syntax, phonetics, you see. And then you see, I insert there my, my, my more one, etc. Et so you have the norms, practices, identity, body. So, so the, the, the lower you get, you, the more you are in the physical. So you can in this way combine. But then um, I have applied this model, let's say, already to some analysis in my book of, of Mozart and about Schumann C major fantasy, which is perhaps the most advanced. And in, in Robert Schumann's case, often these, these levels can be in conflict with the other. OK, now let's take away this model. Now I have gathered here, now comes the musical part, some examples from Ettor uh, Villalobos and uh, Jan Sibelius, which um, illustrate these four semic uh, uh, modalities, let, let's say MOA1, MOA2, SWA2, SWA1. Of course, um, uh, CEMIC is already the, uh, is still the DASA in the real life. But when this is represented, we get a sign or text. And that's something I call as SIG CEMIC or sign CEMIC. So I am move now on the sign CEMIC level in which I try to, in Villa Lobos and Sibelius, find out if there can be um, discovered. Um, Something like, like that. I have some 22 examples. I play very short because uh, you, you may know these pieces, but it's enough for you to, uh, to identify what I mean. Now I uh, move at, at the piano. Yes, you can see me. So let us now. Moa one. Kinetic energy. I take two cases uh, extreme kinetic energy and then uh, extremely. Language slow detentional uh, as op so two opposition of this uh, moi one. So you know this. <laughs> That's the Indio Brango. That would be moi one. There is very there is nothing nothing but but this uh, very strong kinetic movement. I would say. Of course, then appears the theme. Note it is syncopated. That's important in Latin American music. You know, some melody can be very banal, like uh, that's terrible. <laughs> that is a song with certain words in Finnish, which I can repeat. But when it is syncopated, it becomes something congenial. That was stated by, by I think, Alejo Carpentier in his study on the music show. So you have this, this example, and then another case of Extreme, <laughs> extreme kinetic energy. Of course, this. Sexta uh... acerta. No course, Albinis. <laughs> Maybe they're behind, but but that is also typical. Then. Uh... Sibelius. Very heavy, heavy brass sound, and this very this heaviness is certainly very very kinetic. So we don't distinguish it too much. Thing. Of course, then <laughs> uh, I only mention it because uh, then it continues. Um... <laughs> it comes, of course. Tchaikovsky, Fifth Symphony, is directly from Tchaikovsky, the same heavy brass sound, I would say. Uh, and then, of course, Sibelius has a hand in Karelia suite. Uh,
So there is only, only this movement. It is going very, very fast. So it is in more one unit momentum. But then we have also this um, other type, this uh, extremely slow, slowly energy. Almost, almost then we have this. National anthem. So it's, it's, it's a movement. And we have the same idea of the stopping energy, let's say also in the. I will never do that in the European music. But it's Brazilian. The, the emotional nature is totally different. <laughs> so in, the, in Brazilian music, you know, you can do it in the race. But I can't do that. So, but, and then Sibelius. Festivo, which is also extremely slow. Uh, it is something when you go to C major, um, only to C major, it's coming from Italy, Wagner, Meistersinger, a little bit, but um, it is just um, reflects the same very, very slow. But uh, also in the music with the uh, Quintes, Schicksal Quintes, the Sibelius is last major key, we have this uh, Miranda. Now let's go to uh, Moa II. Moa II, which is the of my time, um, uh, melody, actual reality. It's the person. Person Hello. is the act. Very much the melody. Then you have the theme, melody, thematic arch, which is denied in in uh, serial music and political music lately. But uh, uh, you have this Eros. and then called Monologos. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Sorry, sorry, your sound is, is very low right now. You can. What can I do? If you you can uh, you can uh, just be more uh, more close to the, the computer. I I think so. Aha! All right, all right. The sound is very low. Okay. Can you better hear me now? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm sorry if you missed something, but it, no, okay, but, okay, but um, but uh, of course, the only it's the Iberian. Iberian, Iberian melody is uh, uh, rising up and then the leap. So it, it is uh, one of the origin of the, of the actual reality. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, 
Wait a minute. Aha, time is running. Um, uh, yes, I mentioned already MOA2. Um, Sibelius, um, Sibelius is melodic archetype. Uh, Sibelius uh, almost never used folk tunes. And this question of folklorism is, of course, very essential because um, neither Villalobos nor Sibelius were the folklorists, after all. That is the very important story. They were more than folklore. So, so they, uh, Sibelius almost never used any folk tunes. Uh, of course, he did it. But, and if he did, he denied it. He didn't like the idea. But for instance, one melody for Caprice. Uh, of course, the prototype of Siberian melody is just the long note triplet figure getting down and then stepwise up. This, this is the form, basic archetype of almost all Sibelius. At least 60 or 70 percent of his melodies are like a swallow tonella. That is the typical. But then he had the, his case of this um, um, folk song. So that is the, the, the one of the very rare cases in which he, he uses just uh, some some kind of. Um, what is typical is so called a uh, de actoriality, so that he repeats the same melody so much that it loses its uh, actorial quality and becomes a line, like like a musical space only. That is very typical. So in that that sense, um, people have the uh, image of Sibelius that um, there is no subject moving in the landscape. It was just because of these techniques. Now, in the Villa Lobos, of course, we have the. <laughs> uh, well, I have so many examples, but I can't. Uh, of course, Nazareth. Uh, about this folklore, uh, in Sibelius had, of course, this uh, Finno Ugrian, Finno Ugrian nature, which, uh, which emerges every now and then. And if you are the formula, like violin concerto, which is played by all greats, uh, very few know, for instance, uh, that this is Finnogrian. <laughs> and this, this quality appears in, in, in many, many of, of his. <clears throat> Many of these melodies. Um, then Sua too, this genre topics. Well, uh, I mentioned already Ernesto Nazareth, uh, his Brazilian tango, but of course, you know, Milovos did not, uh, but, but rarely you, you use quote it, but somehow uh, this rhythmic word of Nazareth is there often, often somehow behind, I, I would say. Um, This rhythmic word, however. Um, 
and then they come to the sua one the last corner the the the, the aesthetics the aesthetical values what are there and of course um, that that's very very exciting because if you think of a work like soros number 11 which i consider perhaps the major work of Edgar Villalobos, with this huge piece in Libre, which is not very often performed, but, uh, but, but um, it is um, it no longer Brazilian, it is uh, South American, it, it represents the whole continent, so to say, uh, because it, it has so many diverse elements from, 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 uh, from many sources, um, um, so that, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. Yes. Is something like this. okay? So, so that the uh, Soros is certainly, and its um, its form is something which I would really like to study with the narrative methods, and um, and altogether I say that uh, Villa Lovas would be an ideal case for my existential studies, and and for any kind of more um, advanced uh, semiotic analysis, and I would say, uh, but this mythical, of course, the mythical myth is always present some, somehow there in both composers Sibelius and Villalobos. Uh, we might so um, Amazonas uh, it becomes another radical but uh, in Sibelius let's say Kyllikki this is the mythical. That is the das mythische. That is the mythical. Those harmonies, um, in harmonica and just flattened harmonies, are very strong there. Um, well, and then I have, of course, the, the sublime das erhaben. This German category is. But uh, basically, the European aesthetic categories are no longer valid in Brazilian music. <laughs> no longer valid in Villa Lobos in, and in any of this. There is something totally new and creative. I must say. So you cannot put this music at all due to any traditional aesthetic manifestation like the tragical, the comical, uh, the, the, the everyday, the, the sublime, the, the, the gracious, uh, all these, these categories which are very European. It's something else. Some, and what, what it is, uh, is would be really the, <coughs> the, really the challenge for for the analysis well i think i've been already taking much of your time and and, and i'm sorry if, if the <laughs> quality of the music was not very good due to this <laughs> also to technical connections but but anyway i'm now here and i'm if you want to ask from me oh yes by the way i have not answered the question of dios neo makado neto i see uh, it was very fascinating your your question Put it. Well, it was uh, something uh, questioning this whole decolonial um, attitude. Uh, so maybe you felt that uh, we Europeans are somehow exercising our intellectual <laughs> categories by by these uh, by these issues to the to, to Brazil, which is something different. But maybe perhaps you would like to say yourself something about this. I don't know. Leison, você, você quer é, passar a palavra para o Diógenes, fazer a pergunta? Isso, isso. Ele está é, ele, ele, ele comentando, Diógenes, perguntando se você quer falar alguma coisa sobre a sua pergunta. É, ah, ele está sem ele, som. Ele colocou no chat alguma coisa aí. Você, você pode produzir? Ele está sem som. Ero, Diógenes, there is no microphone right now. Oh, I see. Oh, no problem at all. I just mentioned because it's an interesting question, this uh, epistemological. What is the epistemology we, we, we are following? 
uh, when, the, when we, we are making this, this study. So certainly we, um, these scholars will live in certain epistem epistemological situations. Uh, there are certain fashions in science which, which are now everything is digital. <laughs> Digital is everything. It was um, some time ago. Everything was cognitive. Then it was structural. So there are fashion, but but somehow this um, I don't know. And um, this um, colonial issue in which we try to diminish the value of the century of the European musical canon. All these gender studies and and um, new musicology. They they try to so to say. Uh, they try to get rid of, of this uh, statutory canon, but, but and I agreed earlier, I must say, but now no longer, because I'm afraid that this canon is disappearing altogether under um, other types of, of, of musical practices in our, our culture. So I'm rather <laughs> scared that this uh, canon, uh, that young people, if we speak about uh, decanonizing, they don't even understand what it means. They should first learn this canon by 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 um, quite traditional uh, musical education. So that's my comment nowadays. But anyway, you may disagree. Thank you, Iro. Uh, Son, uh, there's a question by Rodolfo Coelho and Norton. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I I guess, guess Eros tried to. Try to... I, to I answer think, during that is yes. I think he answered already during the, the lecture. I don't think yeah. that we rephrase the thank question. You. It's. I thank you very much for the. But uh, I guess Luciano has a a question. Great. Good morning to all, Mr. Charas. Thank you for your attention. Yes. And my question is. In existential semiotic aspects, does the music of Villa Lobos reveal a dualistic relationship as dominated from the European colonialism and dominator over the indigenous identity? I think, is it possible to identify in the music of Villa Lobos this, huh? this different relationship? of the Brazilians are dominated by the European colonization and we are the dominators over the indigenous identity. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, I would say, a very, very typical, typical situation in the colonial um, world because um, sometimes those who are dominated, they try to get rid of the position by, by, by uh, dominating others. They, they can always find some communities which are weaker, weaker, and, uh, and so they, they, they move this relation to, to some other community. This happens in, 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 in the Europe <laughs> very often. Let's say in Europe we have, the, we have the Germany and Italy. They say this, that is the European music. And then um, they say in, in German, alles andere bleibt am Rande. All the others remain in periphery. Let's say uh, France, uh, England, uh, Scandinavia, Russia, Poland, Czech, it's, it's uh, peripheric. So the, that's very colonial. But then may come some composer like Sibelius who wants to make a reform of the symphonic form. He wants to change the lang of symphony by creating something new. Um, well, uh, certainly that is not accepted uh, at all by, by this. But um, uh, in Brazil, case of Brazil, uh, that's certainly quite true because uh, this indigenous character in Villa Lobos is something to be to be to be studied very carefully. Because I, I remember in 1976 I saw in museum those uh, Rocchetti Pintos, uh, <laughs> uh, the recordings of the Rondonia music. They were in a very bad state in in one one closet there in the, in, in dust. Uh, but, but maybe they are now better. But um, um, yes, and then the way Bill is using, but let's say in Shoros number three, I think he comes uh, close to something very authentic or even more authentic than the in the Indian music. I saw a similar type of music uh, later by the chorus to Anthony Seeger, who was my good friend in, in 
who studied the Suya Indians, as you know, uh, and their the, um, flute orchestras, which made uh, triads. So, so I think intuitively, Villalobos tried to get into the spirit in the same way like Bela Bartok in his Bela Bartok in his music um, tried to create some kind of a pan pan um, pan East European model in which you could never say what is really Hungarian, Slovakian, Romanian, Turkish. Uh, uh, you can never say anything as really authentic. It's an illusion. Everything is loaned, loaned from, from someone else. So, uh, but of course, Villalobos was not a Bela Bartok. He, he never made such very systematic uh, studies, but, but intuitively, as a musician, he did much, I think. Okay. Great question, Luciano. Uh, there you. is a, another more, another one. Want to? Marines colocou algo aí no chat? Não. Ela pergunta se pensa, ao invés de pensar em, é, instead of thinking about folklore, could we think about é, cosmologies that are present in both Sibelius and Villa Lobos? What do you think, Hiro? Yeah, uh -huh, that's very, very interesting point. So cosmologies, you mean uh, some kind of uh, the deeper, deeper worldview which they will share, cosmology, or, or some idea of the how the universe is structured. Yeah, she said that. Uh... She, she reminds of Kalevala, a uh, work oh, about oh. mythical people from Finland, yes? Yes, yes. Sure, sure, we, we have, well, it's a question whether there is a universal human mind, and whether, whether this, all this mythology at the end, that they belong to the same treasure of, of mankind. And, uh, and certainly, uh, I think Levi Strauss, Levi Strauss already showed by his uh, mythologic how, how we can analyze, let's say, huge complex systems of mythical thought in 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 huge areas and find their their um, common structures. I think it's quite possible, and uh, I do believe that uh, very often these mythical themes are, are borrowed from one place to other. So and then they they dive up amazingly uh, new and fresh in different parts of the world, and even without uh, mutual direct impact or influence. So this can be then due only uh, to the human mind, which is just um, um, this uh, la, 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 pensée, la pensée sauvage, or this kind of uh, mythical thought, which, which uh, manifests in, in, in all, this, all these issues. Yes, Kalevala, certainly, you are right. It's interesting case here. <laughs> Yeah. Eloisa, do, do you want to talk something about this decolonial or, or no? no? People is talking about this uh, kind of uh, values of uh, uh, decolonial, that uh, uh, there is a, a kind of uh, kind of phrase here, this uh, if the the, the studies of, of colon, the colonial studies uh, used to modificate in some way uh, Villa Lobos' aesthetic approximation. Mm -hmm. ah, so, so this colonial attitude, well, certainly Villa Lobos was, um, he was very uh, practical man. He, was, he could adapt to different situations in, in the, and changes in the society. And so he could adapt for his own, own models and own, own um, composing manners to what was expected from him. So he had, uh, had a sensibility for, for this um, uh, social orders, <laughs> so to say, what we had. So, um, but um, altogether, I think his case is the one of this extreme creativity and um, the, uh, this inexhaustible imagination, uh, which his music is shown uh, in, in, in every respect. If we take only this Moa one, the, the sonority, the sound, sound of his music, this orchestration, uh, like Olive Messiaen has, but he's, he's truly great and quite unique. So that, um, hmm. but of course we could study how these um, four modes of being, how, how are they in conflict or in, in, um, 
a mutual uh, harmony. Harmony in middle is, uh, let's say, the sound actual reality uh, topics or social practice and, and then aesthetics. And if they are in conflict, then how it appears? In my study of Robert Schumann, I showed how they are in conflict, really, <laughs> in this fantasy C major, which is a huge symphonic piece. But I, I think that in Villalobos, hmm, you might find something, but, but that's really something that one should be do in future, I believe. <laughs> And, uh, I have I have some uh, some question about this. Uh, when you talk about this uh, Muan and Soa, you know um, Villa Lobos. In some moments there is a, a Mua over Soa, and another moment there is a Soa going over the Mua. This different aspect. Do do you think that this this kind of different influence from the Mua over Soa and Soa over Mua, it's a, a kind of archetype of Villa Lobos? Hmm, <laughs> that is a very interesting idea, indeed. Uh, yes, because of course he, his music he is full of such um, interesting and striking opposi oppositions of different categories, with, 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 which, by which he, he manipulates he, his music. But uh, hmm, that's something where we have to really, really think how how it goes. Because of course, in his moi, if we think as a person, he gave. He, such an image of himself as a rather difficult person in some circles uh, when he moved and and um, made some to totally mythological statements of his life which was not true at all just to, to get some some social attention in in media uh, press of, of that time but on the other hand uh, in the deeper sense um, um, hmm. yes I don't know how much in Brazil you, you still speak about uh, Villalobos as a national composer of Brazil, your, your national icon, or, or because I remember when I was in Rio de Janeiro, some, some told that uh, that time is over. That, uh, I remember the pianist uh, Eton Alimonda said that his, his fame is over, <laughs> that it's, it's no longer, no longer. but, but uh, well, that's up to you. <laughs> Just a minute. And uh, do you think Sibelius is it's the same way? There is some uh, some pieces or some some music that uh, Mua is going over Sua or, or, in, or in the other way. I'm talking uh -huh, about this this. Is... I'm talking yes. about this this dynamic Islamic mode. You know, you, you we can go from yes, Mua yes. one to Sua one and go from Sua one to Mua one. There is this aspect in Sibelius. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's also very good because you could first study the, the symphonic form, symphonic development in, the, in that light that, that in, in some part of the symphony you have more of the sua and the other part is more of the, of the, of the moa, moa sua. So they, they alternate their, their relevance or pertinence. Uh, it, it, um, it's, it changes and it is transformed. I think it, it's, that's a good idea for analysis. Because we need for analysis just such, such ideas how to study. If you study only the, of course, the score is the basis. <laughs> it's the basis for what's written down there. But, but then uh, it is still only score. You must, you must see there are some ideas uh, in order to. So I don't believe that in that grounded theory by Americans that you say that they have, there's only empirical facts and then the theory grows automatically. <laughs> I don't believe in that. You must have a theory, some kind of conceptual framework um, whereby you try to explain the music. What it is for Villa Lobos, of course, is very, very interesting question. Hmm. Yes, yes. Temos mais questões? Alguém? Mais alguma? Tem alguma no, no YouTube, Paulo? Let, let's see the, the YouTube chat. It's about a, 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 if we have any oh. question. There's a question by Laura Calabi. Uh, I will reproduce her question. Please, yes. can you extend your ideas about music and myths? Oh, oh. General music question. and myths. Yeah. Oh, heavens. Oh, it's a very big question. I've read one big study of, of just music, music and myth, but um, 
but it is also it's an eternal theme. You, you, it's perpetual. You all <laughs> you always return to this essential essential problem because mythical thought is, is just something something which continues uh, continues um, all the time. And well, yes, uh, yeah, you can continue by by so many means because the you can think mythical as a quality of the. That mythical, mythical appears in the text, like like in the composition by Villalobos, as a overall aesthetic quality somehow. But then you can also think it's narrating a myth. There's a sto mythical story which is told by certain techniques, and then you can identify, let's say, uh, certain musical um, processes, uh, uh, actors, how how it is done, and then you can use the Grimacian formalization, if you, if you like. Uh, the Buddha. So, so it's very diverse. The, the myth is something which is occupying us as always. And even in nowadays, we might think that this um, indigenous world is somewhere very far away. Of course, it is now in danger of, of total destruction. I know in, in your country and in many places, so it, it must be protected. But but um, uh, but this um, uh, mythical thought continues uh, also in the so so to say. Um, um, industrial societies, uh, we call it a myth mythologism. Mythologism, it's a secondary, secondary mythical thought, not primal. Let's say Suya India in River Shingu, he lives in, in primal mythicism. We, in, in this, uh, at these comfortable chairs and rooms, uh, libraries, uh, uh, we, we live in um, this um, mythologi mythologism. This term is from Yuri Lotman from the from the Tartu scholar mythologism, so it's secondary. So I think that's a very good question. Mais alguma, Paulo? É basicamente isso. O resto repete, né? Almost the same. But that, that's okay. it. Okay. okay, there is another question here, in the, in the Zoom. Okay, I, first of all, I, I would like to say you, Eros, the, 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 this was a, a very great lecture and speech, and uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> a very great, great pleasure to be with you here, and you are here in the Zoom. And uh, I would like to say you thank you very much about this uh, for this lecture for this time that you are expanding here with us. Kitos eros. Kitos. Thank you, thank you. Muito obrigado. Kitos eros. Thank you. It was my, my, my delight and pleasure completely to be with you. It was very uh, honor and nice to be here. And I wish you really great success in your Villa Lobosian studies. It's very important that it continues just in, in Brazil, uh, I think so. And thanks, Son, for being my moderator. And thanks, Paulo, uh, for inviting me to this, this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope your okay. book will be, will be uh, finished next year. Will, oh, yes. great. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Sure. I will okay. send you some, bye -bye. some proof. Thank you. Some proof already. Kitos. Bye-bye. Kitos, kitos. Bye-bye. Obrigado. Hey, hey. Até logo. Até logo. <risos> moi, moi. Queridos amigos, prazer em